Now, we just had to share that one story from Second Chronicles, and there are others in there, but that's one that often gets skipped, so I um, thought it was worth, uh, worth bringing up. Now we jump into Ezra and Nehemiah. Now, in our oldest versions of the, the Hebrew Bible, or what we call the Old Testament, Ezra and Nehemiah are, are one, one work, one book. We've since separated them out, but there are actually th um, three major groups who are going to come into these stories between Ezra and Nehemiah. So to fill you in in the timeline, keep in mind, let's just, let's just do a timeline coming down this way. 600 BC, in Jerusalem you get Lehi and you get Jeremiah and other prophets making all of these prophecies about if you don't repent, Babylon's going to come and, and carry you away captive and destroy our city and kill many of you. And many of the people felt like, you guys are weakening the strength of the city. We should just trust in these mighty walls of Jerusalem and in our arms, and it didn't work. And we have the temple here, and they believed that as long as we've got the temple here, we've got the presence of God on our side, nobody can overthrow us. We're good. You, you guys must be the evil ones. Yeah, it is a little sad that they had missed the purpose of the temple. It was a sign that God's presence was with them, but they believe, well, if God's presence is here, all is good. We'll just let God fight our battles. We see that God will fight battles if you choose to look you, to him if you turn and to listen him. <laughs> to God's chosen servants, like Jehoshaphat was. If you say, I'm going to let God fight my battles, but I'm not going to listen to him, um, you're going to find yourself in battle with God. <laughs> so that, that's kind of what happened there. Then the problems really start kicking into gear in 597 with Jehoiakim and the, the leadership of, of Jerusalem. The king of Babylon comes, carries him away with the first wave, and then they put uh, Zedekiah on the throne, kind of a puppet king. Yeah, the Babylonians want a king in Judah that will take orders from Babylon and to make sure that the tax dollars are flowing back to Babylon. That's right. So when Zedekiah m tries to make an alliance with Pharaoh and the Egyptians, who are kind of the dynasty of the past, and they're, they're past their prime as far as military dominance, well, that makes Nebuchadnezzar pretty upset, so he comes in, wipes out the city, that's about 587, 586 BC, when we then carry them captive, finally, into Babylon and wreck the city. I mean, the destruction layer is significant. Archaeologists have gone in and seen massive ash layers and homes torn down, and we've actually discovered some amazing things. For example, the scribe of Jeremiah, we have found um, his, his signet ring that he used to seal documents. A lot of really incredible discoveries, but just very sad to realize that all these people who had trusted in the strength of the cities did not trust in the source of that strength, which was God. And God's like, you know what? I've given you all these opportunities. You guys have broken the rules and the laws of this homeland. So therefore, I'm going to let you go into another land, and you can go hang out with those fake gods for a while and see how that works out for you. <laughs> so here we are in Babylonian exile, and that's where we're going to pick up some other stories down the road with, with Daniel. Um, Ezekiel is going to be out with that first wave that, that was taken out of Jerusalem at the, out on the river um, in Babylon. So we'll pick up some of those st stories later on in the year. Well, fast forward now to our, our timeline for today's lesson, which is Ezra, Nehemiah. So in 539, 538, in the 530s, then Persia comes to town, and destroys the kingdom of Babylon. So all of these Israelites have been taken out of their home, taken to the east, into Babylon. Now Persia comes from northern, the northern part of that region in Mesopotamia, comes down, overthrows Babylon. Um, Persia is combined later on with Media. Yeah, it's kind of a combined force coming out of the Iranian plateau, and it's, this becomes a pivot point in world history. It impacts the Bible, but a lot of other things happen in world history. 
because of this. We'll, we'll talk about a few of those points. So keep in mind, the, the king here, he's very, he, he kind of stands out, not just in our biblical record, but in our ancient history record in general. This guy, Cyrus, the king of Persia, he is a king unlike almost any other of the of the world's dynasties uh, monarchs. He he has a totally different approach. Instead of coming up and ruling with with a heavy, heavy hand or using terror tactics, Cyrus does quite the opposite. He he wins people over by actually serving them and finding out what they what they would like and trying to meet those needs. It's it's quite refreshing. Ironically, he's he's the only one in our Old Testament to get the official title of a Mashiach or a Messiah, an anointed one, almost as if to say God anointed him for this role to be able to help the house of Israel, and not just the house of Israel, but many other conquered kingdoms as well, but our focus in the in the biblical account is on the, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin who have been carried away captive and others with them. So he, be, he literally becomes a savior for them, a Messiah figure to send them back into Jerusalem to rebuild their temple. And keep in mind, if you look at the dates here, from 586 down to the 530s, you actually have a group of people who return to Jerusalem who remember the glory days when the temple, before the temple had been destroyed. And so they're going to come into the story here a little bit later, and they, they can do some comparison here. But what an amazing thing that the Lord can use people who are not in the covenant with him to still do covenantal things for his work to move forward anyway. He's a Gentile. This is exactly your point. God chose a Gentile, calls him a Messiah in Isaiah, to deliver his people. So Persia is where modern-day Iran is today, so one of the world's great empires. In fact, Iran has had at least three of the world's great empires across human history. It turns out that many of the people in Babylon didn't really like their leaders. The leaders were oppressive, and it turns out that when Cyrus came, it was in some ways a deliverance even of the Babylonian people from their overlords in Babylon who were just extracting wealth and resources and living and, and having the people live in terror. I also want to point out, as Tyler was saying, there's about a 50-year gap here. 50 years is a long time. That's almost two full generations. So you imagine now the Jews have been living in Mesopotamia, right in the middle of these two major rivers, Euphrates and the Tiger, Tigris River, and many of them have settled down. We've since archaeologically discovered a lot of documents from this time period. Uh, there were Jews that were running banks in Babylon. They're taking on Babylonian names. You'll see that in Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, and they basically have decided, all right, well, we're here. We are going to they're still practicing being good Israelites, but they've integrated themselves into much of the culture and the language to the point that when the Jews are allowed the opportunity to return, scholarship suggests maybe only about 10% of the Jews actually return to Jerusalem. And fascinating fact, it was only with the declaration of the state of Israel in 1948 that the Jewish community that had been in Iraq or Babylon since almost 600 BC, started to fully return. The longest standing and wealthiest community and often the best educated community of Jews across most of history was the group in Babylon that was there from about 600 BC all the way until just about 70 years ago. Is that fascinating? Amazing. So 2,600 years that they had stayed there and then finally with the state of Israel, they're like, okay, it's time to return. So again, only maybe 10, 10 or 15% returned here in the stories of Ezra and Nehemiah. So for those of you who want that reference to where Cyrus is called a Messiah by Isaiah, it's uh, in chapter 45 verse 1 of Isaiah where, where you get that reference. And um, by the way, keep in mind, Cyrus, we, we told you what an amazing leader he is. 
he ends up building the biggest world empire that we know of up to that point in the history of the world. He, he goes from the Indus River clear out to the Mediterranean, he never quite gets down into Africa, but his domain, his kingdom Even is, portions of Egypt is huge. Eventually got taken. We probably should point out that he declares religious freedom. That's right. And there's something called the Cyrus Cylinder that archaeologists have discovered. A copy of it is now in the UN building in New York. And it's the oldest document we have from the ancient world where we have essentially religious freedom declared. Again, as Tyler's pointing out, Cyrus realizes, huh, if I am respectful to all these different religious groups and encourage them to worship as they see fit, my guess is they'll be more likely to be loyal to me and to pay their taxes. And it turns out he was right. He was right. And so the United Nations, seeing this as a powerful example of good leadership, has that document, among many others, uh, at the United Nations as a reminder that when we live in a very a global world with lots of lots of nations and religions, we have to find ways to live in peace with one another. And Cyrus, one of God's anointed, modeled for us one way to do that is to be respectful for other people and even encourage people to, to be involved in their religion to the point that Cyrus takes this wealth that the Babylonians acquired and he hands it back to the people that had been stolen from. So he gets all this wealth that had been stolen from the Jerusalem temple and says to the Jews, here's all this wealth back. How about you guys go back and worship God? I think that you guys will be better citizens if you take this wealth, rebuild your temple, and stay covenantally connected to God. And I think I would hope that I could live my life in such a way that whoever I interact with, that I could empower them with resources to be loyal and connected to God, however that might work for them.